Welcome to our report launch, China's Climate Transition Outlook this year, with the support from Bo. We'll just get started. So this year, uh, our focus is on China's CO2 emissions still increasing, but clean energy surge has also brought the peak closer than ever. And uh, this is about uh, Korea, and you can also find more information about us on our website. And uh, I'd like to briefly talk about China's emissions and uh, its climate commitments. We are looking at a journey uh, of China's carbon emissions. So since the Paris Agreement in 2015, China has been responsible for 19% of uh, the global emission growth in global emissions. That's a huge number. But then around 2013, something interesting happened. China's emission growth started to level off. Uh, it's because the economy slowed down and uh, the national anti-corruption campaign discouraged the local governments and uh, together with the national action plan against the air pollution, the battle for blue skies. So, however, this didn't last long and COVID shook things up again. Emissions bounced back, back up in late 2020 and early 2021. What's crucial here is understanding the structural drivers behind these changes. It's not just about the numbers, it's about uh, what's happening on the ground, the policies and uh, the economic shifts and uh, the move towards clean energy, cleaner energy. And China's climate commitments leave room for a variety of emission pathways. It's like China has several roles that they can take to meet, to meet their climate goals. The critical thing to note here is that China's current climate uh, commitments allow for a range of uh, CO2 emission outcomes. This means that depending on the policies and actions China take, the actual emissions could vary quite a bit. Uh, for example, you can see the top red one shows the red pathway shows the highest possible emissions that China could follow while still meeting the targets. And um, there's a consistent effort pathway, the yellow one. This one's more about a steady approach um, where emissions plateau until 2025 and then started to fall. And of course, there's 1.5 degree pathway. Uh, and uh, this one's super challenging, but very important. So what we are seeing here is, it's not just about setting the targets, it's about choices and actions that, that follow. And uh, also let me briefly explain the methodology and key indicators we've used in our research. Uh, our research methodology is like piecing together a complex puzzle. We've integrated a variety of climate scenarios from different sources to project China's potential climate trajectories. So this year we've included a new, new scenarios, broadening our perspectives. Uh, and these scenarios have helped us to, to gauge whether China is on, on course with its climate commitments and where adjustments may be necessary. It's not just about China's current state, but also about uh, predicting their uh, future path based on solid research. In terms of indicators, uh, which is also a key part of our research, we've identified critical metrics like clean energy capacity and uh, oil consumption, etc., to assess China's climate commitments. So these indicators are, comp are compared against the historical trends and also future climate model predictions. This allowing us to evaluate China's current uh, trajectory. We've set benchmarks for each indicator based on various climate transition scenarios. This approach helps us analyze specific areas against uh, expected progress in these scenarios. It's a forward-looking method that gives us a clearer picture of China's journey moving beyond the simple and an simple annual emissions analysis. And uh, Lori? Thank you, Cixin. So the um, different uh, sectors that we're covering um, include electricity, industry buildings and transport, and then, of course, the total for the entire economy. We're looking at indicators such as CO2 emissions, fossil fuel consumption, clean energy production, um, energy consumption, total energy consumption, uh, new investments in capacity or infrastructure, new sales, for example, of vehicles, and uh, electrification. So this way we're breaking uh, progress down into a total of about 30 different metrics. So then into the, the results of, of this year's assessment. Uh, first of all, it's not a good year simply in terms of CO2 emissions. 
we estimate that in the first three months of the year, CO2 emissions uh, from fossil fuels increased by, by about 6.5%. Uh, you can see the acceleration um, starting from early 2023 in the monthly uh, graph. Uh, the growth was driven by power sector coal use, reb rebound in oil product consumption after the lifting of COVID restrictions, and uh, an increase in coal use for steel. Uh, the one sector where emissions fell is uh, the production of uh, cement and other building materials uh, due to contraction in the real estate sector. One important thing to discern is that quite a bit of the growth in uh, power sector coal consumption was because of variations in hydropower variability, which uh, availability, which have been quite extreme in the past couple of years. And that's why the affected indicators this year are shown as weather controlled. So we're controlling for these variations. And uh, we project that uh, based on the first three quarters of, of data, the full year emissions will increase by at least 4%. And so China's emissions are already significantly up from uh, 2020 um, levels uh, at the moment. And that means that in order to get in line with the emission reduction pathways um, that are consistent with China's net zero um, target, uh, very significant reductions are going to be uh, required in the next years. The government said in the beginning of the year that they would uh, introduce uh, introduce uh, control of total CO2 emissions and uh, CO2 intensity um, as a tool to implement um, the uh, emission peaking and reductions. But unfortunately, there has been little progress or clarity on, on the timeline for that. And there's also been a lack of progress in terms of of making um, CO2 emission data on the province or sector or national level uh, public. The main reason why China's emissions ha went up this year and, and have kept going up despite impressive efforts on clean energy is that uh, China's economic growth um, during and after zero COVID um, have been, has been very energy intensive, coming from the most energy intensive um, sectors. And uh, this is also... Uh, the remedy. There's little uh, scope under the current pattern of, of growth for technical energy efficiency to improve things because on in industry, the potential is largely exhausted. In other sectors like buildings, there is still uh, potential. The uh, rapid increase in energy demand means that it will be very hard for China to meet uh, the energy intensity target that it has set for 2025 and that it has also included in its Paris uh, pledge. Um, so you would need um, five percent uh, GDP growth and and uh, almost zero growth in energy demand for the next few years to meet the target. In terms of uh, carbon intensity target, which is the other um, key target that China has set for 2025, it's still possible if clean energy growth is maintained or increased, but it's also going to be challenging and important to watch. Then for the good news, um, this year's growth in clean energy is absolutely staggering. We expect, and and uh, most uh, analysts expect, that China's uh, additions of solar power this year will uh, will hit uh, 200 gigawatts or more. Uh, for comparison, the United States has 150 gigawatts in total. So China's adding more than the entire installed capacity in the U.S. in just uh, one year. And that just that also means that China's annual additions of clean electricity generation are now in line with even the most ambitious emission reduction scenarios. And importantly, they exceed um, the average in, uh, growth in electricity demand, which means that if this level of uh, clean energy additions are maintained, there's no space for fossil fuels to grow in power generation, which should bring about um, a peak in emissions. There was also progress um, over the past two years in reducing the reliance of the economy on construction and real estate, which has been a key driver of, of China's emissions uh, over the past decade. So construction materials like uh, cement, um, steel, glass, and so on have come down for, from their peak in 2021. The economic transition that has taken place is, is quite different from what we expected, but no less dramatic. Um, so the investment that used to go into real estate has rotated into industrial manufacturing. And uh, 
much of it into clean energy manufacturing. The, it's it's worth highlighting the scale here. We're talking about uh, trillions of uh, renminbi, so hundreds of billions of uh, dollars or euros um, being invested in in uh, manufacturing. So what what happened this year is that for the first time, uh, clean energy manufacturing is an important, a key economic driver in China. China is basically building all the manufacturing capacity that the world um, could need even in a rapid energy transition for um, electric vehicles, solar panels, batteries, and so on. And uh, the investment in these technologies is the key driver of overall uh, fixed asset investment this year, uh, which means that it's, it plays a crucial role in meeting this year's economic targets, GDP target, and so on. Uh, so we assess that that all of the net growth in fixed asset investment this year came from clean energy technologies. This means that these industries have a much higher weight in China's political economy and uh, and in China's economy than they used to, and that that makes the uh, transition more robust. Uh, back to negative news, permitting an investment boom in coal-fired power that started last year has continued into this year. China pledged and Xi Jinping pledged uh, back in 2021 to strictly control new coal-fired power plants, but unfortunately, the exact opposite happened. The approvals of new coal-fired power plants doubled in the, two, in the two years after the pledge. The background to this is electricity shortages that took place in 2021-22 uh, that uh, led the central government to reverse uh, their policy on coal-fired power. However, most of the projects that have been permitted can't be justified by a lack of uh, capacity. They're rather a result of uh, rigid and outdated electrical grid management on which there's been little progress solving. Uh, the same picture applies to coal-based steelmaking. The steel uh, sector is the largest emitting sector in China when um, CO2 em uh, emissions from its electricity use are included. And uh, investments in coal-based uh, steel mills have, have continued. We now assess that uh, by 2025, 40% of China's coal-based uh, steel making capacity uh, will be replaced with new units. So aging units replaced with new ones, which is going against the transition that would have to take place in the sector from coal-based um, steel making to electric arc and uh, further into hydrogen-based um, steel making. So this is, these two areas are ones where investments are out of touch with the, with the transition. In transportation, there have be, has been very impressive progress with uh, electric vehicles. This year, electric vehicles will make up 30% of uh, all vehicles produced and sold uh, in China, and their share will go up by about uh, three percentage points out of all vehicles on the road, which means that they're, for the first time, they're making a very substantial dent in gasoline demand. However, oil consumption in transport has has yet increased significantly this year after the lifting of the um, COVID restrictions. Um, and uh, uh, there's a lot more um, that needs to be done here to, to bring the trend in line with the energy redu uh, um, emission reduction scenarios. The last area or sector that we cover in our assessment is non-CO2 greenhouse gases. This is an area where we're not able to make a quantitative assessment because the government does not uh, not uh, publish um, annual data on emissions. In fact, the, the latest data that they've published is for the year 2014. There was some progress. Uh, an action plan on methane was published, but unfortunately it lacked quantitative targets or, or firm timelines. Um, for, for example, peaking emissions or even reporting emissions. On other non-CO2 greenhouse gases, there was unfortunately no progress. Uh, summarizing policy developments. Um, so obviously, policies promoting wind and solar and other clean technologies proved very successful. There was progress on promoting green electricity rate trading, creating demand uh, for green energy through uh, the uh, emission trading system. A coal power capacity payment mechanism was introduced. This could be seen as a part of a transition for the sector, but right now uh, the main effect will be to incentivize new coal-fired power projects because permitting is not being controlled. So this mechanism makes uh, coal-fired power plants 
uh, more profitable or less unprofitable. There was some progress on industrial emissions monitoring and reporting in those sectors that are targeted by the EU's uh, carbon tariffs. Um, so it shows uh, the EU's mechanism there working as it's intended. There are also uh, policy areas where we would expect progress, but didn't see clear progress this year. So in terms of controlling total um, CO2 emissions or in terms of expansion of the carbon market, there was no announcement of a firm um, timeline. Similarly for the power market um, reform and uh, in terms of uh, public reporting of uh, emissions or um, energy on the national or provincial level, there has be not been progress. Next, uh, C will introduce uh, the expert survey that we carried out to, to gauge how China's ex experts in China's climate and energy um, view um, this year and its developments. Thank you. This is the second year that we've done this survey. And this year, we've expanded our pool of experts from 26 to 89. So this expansion allows for a more diverse and comprehensive range of insights and perspectives. We've compared this year's findings with those from the previous year. And uh, this allows us to pinpoint any major shifts or emerging trends that have surfaced over the past year. Our primary focus lies in uncovering any significant changes, especially concerning specific aspects or challenges in uh, China's climate policies and actions. So our survey this year reveals some encouraging trends in expert opinions regarding when China will peak its carbon emissions. In a significant shift from last year, the proportion of experts who believe China will reach its peak carbon emission by 2025 has increased from 15% uh, from last year to 21% in uh, this year. And on the other hand, those predicting a post-2030 peak have decreased. And this change in expert opinion likely reflects a growing confidence in China. The majority now believe that China is on track to, to peak its emissions before 20, 2030. However, it's not, a, about, it's not all about just hitting that peak. There's a concern about the height of this peak, like the graphic on the right hand shows that there's a concern uh, that experts are worried about how high the peak emissions might relative to previous levels. Uh, in fact, 15 out of 89 experts predict that the peak level will be at least 15% higher than China's carbon emission in 2020. So while there's a thing, there's, while there's a, a sense of uh, uh, optimism about uh, when emissions will peak, the scale of these emissions at their peak is a crucial concern. It underscores the imperative for China to not only reach its emission peak in a timely manner, but also to uh, manage and uh, significantly reduce the intensity of these peak emissions. And turning to this slide, we are looking at a key question. Has China's coal consumption peaked? So as per China plans, a peak uh, is expected around 2025. Our experts reveals a mix of opinions. Uh, 18 experts think it has already peaked, but nearly half aren't so sure. So 30 experts are undecided, linking to the peak to China's future economic and uh, political scenarios. Uh, increasingly, of those who don't believe it's peaked, a significant number anticipates it's happening by 2025, but there's a notable rise in uncertainty too. So this year, 34% of experts were unsure about the peak timing compared to only 12% last year. So this reflects complexities in China's energy policy and the intricate balance between economic growth, uh, energy security, and uh, environment, uh, environmental commitments. Yeah, and uh, back to Laurie on our conclusions. Thank you. I noticed that there is one slide missing. We also surveyed uh, the experts' uh, opinion on whether this year's economic challenges have uh, uh, have uh, uh, affected China's energy transition, and the majority of them thought that the economic challenges have, in fact, sped up the transition. There was, of course, differing opinions, but that was uh, the majority, and it aligns with our findings that... Uh, the economic headwinds, especially in real estate, have in fact resulted in a massive investment boom in clean energy. So 
to summarize our assessment uh, of the different indicators, we find that uh, clean energy investments are now aligned with the uh, emission reduction scenarios that are consistent with uh, China's uh, goals. Um, electrification ratio, that, so the shift to electricity, um, is in uh, is on track. Uh, building sector coal use um, is on track. Steel and cement output is following this trajectory. Um, construction material sector emissions, so cement and, and so on, and electric vehicle sales. However, energy consumption across all sectors is growing faster, highlighting the need for economic shifts, um, the shifts in the structure of the economy. And uh, as a result, total emissions still increased um, this year and, and increased much more than they should in the emission reduction pathways. Also, investments in coal-based power capacity and uh, steelmaking capacity are misaligned with the emission reduction uh, pathways. And to summarize the key developments in 2023, China's CO2 emissions rebounded from the roughly zero growth in 2022. The surge in clean energy paved the way uh, for an earlier peak and brought clean energy additions to a level that enables China to, to peak uh, emissions imminently if it chooses to. The clean energy manufacturing boom strengthened the economic and political importance of the clean energy sectors. Um, investments in coal-based capacity accelerated further. Um, the experts grew more optimistic on carbon peaking, and um, there was disappointing progress on emissions reporting and on non-CO2 greenhouse gases. Thank you. Back to you, Hannah. Yes, so now we can start question and answers. If anyone would like to start, you can put your questions in the chat or just raise your hand. Sorry, Dana Heide from uh, Handelsblatt, German Business Daily. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was very um, insightful. Um, I have a question about um, how China, um, how you think China will act during the upcoming COP. Um, from what we are hearing, um, they are blocking progress in the loss and damage fund. Um, and um, they are also expected to, you know, make commitments to the 1.5 Celsius um goal but um what do you expect like do you do you expect anything substantial from the uh from the cop um, from uh, chinese side and also do you think engaging in cooperation with china like germany does um is help does, does it help does this help at all like or is china um you know following their own its own rules anyways like I mean, they are investing heavily, as you said, in renewable energies. Does it really matter if uh, if Germany is cooperating and if Germany wants to have like those climate dialogues and 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 all those formats? Thank you. Um, on on China's positions, I think uh, from looking at the the range of emission trajectories that that the Chinese leadership have has left open for themselves, there's very little willingness to commit um, to more. Uh, more than than what is already on paper at this moment, even if if I uh, said uh, it's likely that that China will overachieve uh, the uh, target of of uh, peaking emissions, um, but uh, very clearly the the leadership has wanted to leave space for different, especially economic policy trajectories, and and uh, the economy is currently the overwhelming uh, focus. And so uh, maybe paradoxically, it is this focus on the economy that is is driving the clean energy investments. I think the area where there is most uh, potential for um, uh, for progress is um, the target of tripling um, renewable energy capacity globally. Because uh, what we're showing here is that China is in fact making a massive bet on the success of the energy transition in the rest of the world. Um, all of the solar PV, battery, electric vehicle, and so on capacity that China is building needs um, the rest of the world to speed up its transition um, in order to make any sense at all um, economically. Um, so that's the area. Um, and China has um, already start increased efforts, for example, on uh, financing uh, clean energy projects overseas and so on. So so that's the area where where I see a lot of potential for progress. That said, it is important that China faces questions about those um, those targets where it's clearly not on track. Um, so uh, the global stock take and uh, and the, the uh, climate summits in general 
are are a place for for countries to try and hold it, each other accountable for their targets. Or the other question, so, so the importance of cooperation, I would say that if if we look at the motivations of China's clean energy drive, it's very much industrial policy. It's wanting to establish um, market leadership, technology, technology leadership in these technologies. So I would say that being that competition, putting up competition um, will help. So if if uh, China's leaders see others slowing down, getting blocked in in uh, domestic uh, debates, not being able to to move, they will feel like they can take it easy as well, and and uh, uh, and vice versa. I do think communication and dialogues are important. So, for example, um, there was a very persistent belief over the past couple of years in China that uh, the EU is increasing coal consumption or going back to coal, even though. Um, though the data and the trends showed the complete opposite, and that showed the lack of uh, communication uh, during COVID. So I, I think dialogue is important. Um, communicating, showing what's what's happening is important. But uh, I think uh, it's hard to see how you can go much beyond that in terms of impact. There are several, a lot of questions in the chat. Thank you so much for those. I think, Hannah, can we just run through them from the top or... So yeah, from Yuji, we have um, a question about um, the report mentioning to enable global emissions to peak fast enough. China needs to not only meet, but exceed its current emissions commitments. Can you elaborate on what actions are required? Thank you for the question. Thank you. So, so the key issue here that we're pointing out is that China's current target still leaves space for emissions to increase by 10 to 15%. Uh, by 2030 from their 2022 level. And uh, given how dominant China has been in driving up global emissions, 90% of, of the increase in emissions since 2015, if if uh, the emission growth in China continues, it's very hard to see how global emissions can peak, let alone decline fast enough. So um, so from this perspective, it's, it's uh, absolutely crucial that China's emissions peak as soon as possible. And especially given the fact that now China has the ability to peak its emissions simply by maintaining clean energy growth at its uh, uh, 2023 level. Yeah. And there's a question from Pan Chen at uh, CGTN. Even though the clean energy investment and capacity are picking up, wind and solar utilization hours don't seem to increase a lot. The utilization hours have uh, stayed pretty um, constant. Um, they're lower than most uh, uh, most other countries, uh, but so as long as they are not um, dropping, the uh, the projection that that we made um, holds that uh, the increase in uh, clean energy should uh, enable um, emissions to peak. It's it's a feature of uh, of China's policy that uh, both uh, wind and especially solar are installed across the country. And this year, the emphasis has been on installing more in the east and on rooftops. Um, so it's not the most favorable locations, but it's the locations that are closest to uh, to consumption centers, and and so they they uh, make sense from the country's overall uh, policy, even if it doesn't give the highest utilization um, hours. But so I th I think the broader point here is that. Even for a grid of China's size, integrating 200 gigawatts of solar, integrating 60, 70 gigawatt hours of wind per year is a challenge to keep up. And that requires a lot of uh, reforms and improvements to the grid. So that's why we are highlighting the importance of, uh, of the electricity market reform to make sure that the incentives for flexible operation, for flexible uh, transmission of electricity with, between provinces and so on are in place, because those are the key shortcomings currently in, in China's electricity system. At the provincial and city level, are um, NECDs leading the pack in terms of emissions reductions? Currently, it's pretty much a competition between all of, um, all of the provinces, so everyone's attracting all the investment um, that they can. Um, this year, in terms of solar, um, Shandong and uh, Anhui stand out as, as the provinces that have been um, the most uh, ambitious in terms of their uh, their distributed solar programs. 
and then of course um, some um, Western provinces have have very very high um, ambitions on on renewable energy side. However, the biggest one, Inner Mongolia, is is both uh, is increasing both uh, clean energy and coal capacity at at very high rates. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Sitin, do you have some any other province to highlight or city? Because I can't see the ah oh, okay. And then there's a question from. Avery, could you give more color on why coal use in the steel sector is growing this year and why experts are more optimistic, optimistic about steel industry's carbon peaking timeline? So the China, China steel sector had a shift to more steel making from, from scrap in the past couple of years and more use of uh, electricity. There's quite a bit of headroom within the existing um, capacity um, that was probably uh, driven by to a large extent by the high coal prices. So one factor is simply that coal prices have come down. But the overall challenge is that coal in China is uh, is quite low cost uh, compared with electricity. And uh, that's why the, the steel sector lacks an incentive to shift to electric uh, steel making. So that's one area where price imp- instruments are likely needed. And uh, then there's a question of the drop in demand. Do these sectors have motivation to decarbonize or shift to to clean um, energy? I th- I think uh, currently the the industry is still investing a lot, as we saw. Um, investments in new capacity have held up, so they don't lack the capacity, the uh, willingness to invest. They lack the incentive to to invest in the right things. Do you expect any progress on methane at the COP from um, Angeli? China just issued its uh, methane action plan, and uh, I imagine that they put everything that they're prepared to put um, in there. But of course, it would be very important to uh, to push China at least to say that they are going to start publishing emission data by a certain year. So the action plan says, um, says that uh, emission reporting is going to be improved by 2025 and improved further by 2030. But then when there's currently no public reporting of emissions, it's hard to say what exactly that improvement entails. So certainly hoping for more progress, but uh, but I don't have a clear reason to believe that there will be new announcements or statements. Then there's a question about uh, the call for phasing out uh, fossil fuels. So So the background is that China quite reluctantly reportedly agreed to the uh, uh, to the uh, language of uh, facing down uh, coal in in Glasgow and since then what has happened is that uh, China's of course had this clean energy growth and has had uh, an even higher emphasis on energy security which then should make China make it easier for China to agree to face a uh, face down at least of fossil fuels the Planning in China on how to get to carbon neutrality and accomplish those um, deep reductions in emissions after, let's say, 2030, 2035 um, is uh, is not there yet. So I think agreeing to a fossil fuel phase out might be a step too far because of that. So, so wanting to keep options open in terms of... Uh, how much do you do with carbon capture versus uh, negative emissions technologies and and uh, biomass with carbon capture um, and and so on? And in terms of China's the optics currently in China, because the the uh, political focus is so heavily on on energy security and on on the economy, then uh, appearing to to strike uh, strike out uh, um, options uh, might not be might not be desirable let's say but uh i so i don't see at least any reason why china could not go from a face down of uh of coal to face down of all fossil fuels because uh because for china obviously coal is is the most important fossil fuel and the whole pushback from especially india but also china was that coal was being singled out unfairly given the fact that china and india rely on coal while um, the EU and the US rely more relatively on on oil and gas, so which which is of course fair as such. 
what needs to happen for the industrial sector to reduce emissions. So the part that is already happening that we highlighted is the scaling down of uh, of the oversized uh, real estate and construction sector that we can hope uh, will continue. Then if you take out that sector, basically the other major sources of um, emissions from the industry are demand for electricity uh, from industry, which needs to be addressed on the power sector, and, and China's on track to doing that. And then there are uh, petrochemicals have been a major um, source of growth um, that is much more uh, challenging, and uh, addressing that will require everything from better transportation policies to incentivizing less use of plastic and so on a much bigger challenge for just about every country. But one thing that will help uh, with the petrochemical and uh, downstream transportation is is that a lot of this is feedstock for uh, for a lot of this is associated with with the heavy bulk um, heavy industries. Um, so so if there is an overall successful transformation away from bulk um, heavy industry, uh, that will help with uh, with uh, essentially all industrial sectors. Uh, for the steel sector, there is a specific opportunity. So uh, for the steel sector, what's happening currently is is that uh, steel demand is um, is flatlining or could be even structurally falling. And at the same time, um, there is more supply of scrap um, uh, from uh, from uh, dismantled buildings, from old vehicles, and so on. And uh, recycling those can replace a lot of this coal-based uh, steel making that is currently the largest source of emissions uh, in China. And uh, steel being the largest um, emitting sector in industry that can have a huge impact on overall industrial emissions. That's all the questions in the chat. Thanks so much. There's one hand from Filippo. Uh, hi, thanks for your presentation. Filippo Santelli for the Italian newspaper La Repubblica. I have a couple of questions. One is since I tend to look everything China related with their internal lens, do you see, and we know how much the coal sector is embedded in uh, the China political uh, structure at all, all levels, central and local, uh, do you see the green tech sector gaining more political agency? And what signs of that do you do you see? The second one is security, because you, you touched a little bit on that. Do you see a, a sort of rethinking in China about energy security, which factors uh, the hypothesis of a coal phase phase down or phase phase out? Uh, for example, in terms of an ideal energy mix. And uh, the last question is uh, um, about the geopolitical aspect of this. Um, you said China is heavily investing in being able to provide the entire world with a green tech supply it needs for the energy transition. Of course, uh, the United States, but even Europe have different opinions on that. I mean, the US uh, considered green tech as being one of the key technologies where to get to, to, to keep an advantage on China and Europe also wants to re-industrialize a little bit on that and we have a probe on Chinese electric vehicles coming. So how, how do you see this geopolitical thing interacting with the Chinese efforts? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Fascinating uh, questions. So yes, of course, uh, uh, the coal industry uh, broadly understood is, is incredibly powerful in China. What is clear is that um, given the current astonishing growth in clean energy and the investments in both new coal mining and uh, and uh, coal power, there is going to be a showdown. All of this cannot um, continue. And, and so the coal industry will push um, uh, for a slowdown, for slowing down uh, clean energy. And uh, whether that's successful is, is, of course, hard to predict. Um, the previous time that this happened, there was uh, an overcapacity situation in coal-fired power around 2015 in China. And at that point, the coal interests uh, successfully uh, convinced uh, the decision makers that uh, that clean energy installations needed to be, uh, be slowed down as well. Uh, the only things that we can say is that because of this much higher weight and importance of, of uh, uh, the clean energy sector's economically and uh, because currently the the co2 peaking and and uh, clean tech has much stronger 
uh, political backing, it will be much harder to, to slow down. So the chances are that the outcome is different, but um, at this stage, no one knows. And, and that's why it's so important that, that China receives the message that, that uh, slowing down now and letting emissions grow for another five years is, is absolutely incompatible incom with the Paris Agreement and, uh, and uh, is not acceptable. Um, in terms of rethinking energy security, there have been a couple of uh, very important um, developments. So China's coal imports have increased very dramatically uh, this year, um, almost doubled year on year. And that seems paradoxical because there have be, been such major efforts into um, increasing domestic uh, coal production. And, uh, and so that has really shown that traditional thinking in China that coal equals energy security doesn't work anymore. Um, the domestic uh, supply was unable to compete with, with imports and uh, uh, imports um, shut up. And uh, that has meant, for example, that the government said that they want to uh, scale back um, the coal to chemicals industry um, expansion, and they want to deprioritize that sector for coal supply. So that was a pretty dramatic shift because the coal to chemical in industry used to be a key part of China's plan to reduce reliance on imported um, oil and gas. So that was that was an important shift. And overall, it's clear that uh, because China has fully domestic supply chains in solar, in wind, in nuclear, um, that uh, those technologies are a part of the overall um, energy security uh, portfolio. But yeah, that's not to say that that efforts on the production side to boost coal, oil, and gas production would be scaled back anytime soon. That's what's happening everywhere in the world right now that everyone's trying to produce more, but well, hopefully consuming less. In terms of the geopolitics, I would say that the fact that we're, we now have all the supply or we're going to have all the supply of uh, solar and uh, electric vehicles and batteries in place for a rapid global transition is a good thing. Um, it's a very legitimate concern that so much of it is in China. Um, and so uh, diversifying, creating um, alternative supply chains, at least for some percentage of uh, the demand in US and the EU uh, is, is a smart thing to do. That still leaves a huge and growing market outside of, of uh, the EU and China, uh, in the EU and the US. So I don't think Chinese producers are too worried about that. And, and also even in the, in the best case, I think uh, the best, the most that uh, the EU and uh, the US are going to be able to do is diversify their supply rather than completely stop buying Chinese equipment. So there's definitely going to be overcapacity. There's going to be cutthroat competition because, because China's supply is increasing so fast and because others are uh, trying to create supply outside of China. But um, for the consumer and, and for the energy transition, that's that's a good thing because that will drive down prices and uh, speed up things. Um, yeah, just to add a little bit that uh, Laurie just mentioned about energy security. Uh, actually, you mentioned about uh, China actually has enough uh, capacity to meet its peak demand. And so the energy sources actually mm, shouldn't be the primary concern about the energy security, but uh, what's more important is the grid development. So... What China should do is to make its uh, grid more flexible, mm -hmm. and uh, in this way to achieve a energy security. Its energy security. This is also what China has been doing, but uh, it, it happens very slowly because of all the interested groups and all the provin pro provincial governments. Uh, they have uh, their own interests, so that's the part that China needs to work on it. I think we've gone through the questions and uh, I think that's it, Hannah. Yep, I think that's it for today. Um, so, yes, thank you everyone for joining us. And um, the report is now live on our website. And um, you can also contact the co-authors by email if you have any further questions. So thanks very much. And we will see you later. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.